Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and supporters of the Kate Hamburger Center for Advanced Studies, Lawyers Culture. On this evening, Professor Dr. Olivier Jean Jean, legal scholar at the University Paris Sorbonne, uh, Paris Assas, qui a dit ça? Paris Assas, qui a fait cela? Comment ça se trouve dans notre texte? Paris Assas, Panthéon Assas, c'est ça. Parce que toi, tu as fait uh, ton doctorat là-bas. Uh, and current fellow at the Cater Hamburger Center Law as Culture will talk about the topic constitutional legal doctrine in France and Germany around 1900. A complex relationship. The transition from the 19th to the 20th century is a magical moment in the history of the German-French scientific relationship. While Claude Dijon notes a type of German crisis regarding French thinking, La crise allemande de la pensée française, j'ai le livre sur moi, je vais vous montrer plus tard, stating the dangerous, dangerous dominance of German thought after France lost the war in 1870-71, there have been nevertheless receptions from the German side. What was the state of constitutional law and the relationship between both constitutional cultures, as I like to say, a central issue of the larger project comparing constitutional cultures that will lead in November to a larger conference together with uh, Jan Zoltrup and a lot of others who are present in this room. Constitutional law discourses in Germany first emerged in the 19th century. They aimed to establish a science of constitutional law strictly distinct from political constitutional discourse. The so-called Gerber-Laban school brought this real scientific treatment of the law through the development of a positivistic juristic method to life. Treating the individual as a reflex of the state's will, at least for Gerber and Laban, as Weber says in his so-called so so Sociology of Law. I would like to quote him. Der Einzelne und seine Interessen sind für die Regierung, dem juristischen Sinne nach, grundsätzlich Objekt, nicht Rechtssubjekt. However, Jelinek, Hanel, Meyer, Lönig saw from a liberal constitutional point of view that relationship as a Rechtsverhältnis. However, the role that this new German constitutional legal doctrine played around 1900 during the founding of a rivaling French constitutional legal thought is less known, and we will hear about this uh, today, this evening. Leon Duguy and Maurice Auriou are on the other side. No sociological nobodies, because you will speak about them, and also Raymond Carré de Malberg, comme Edmar Esma. Uh, Duguy, in his Le droit constitutionnel et la sociologie, published in 1889, is one of the sources of Durkheim's writings on the law, being a little bit more clarified, meanwhile, by an article of Louis Alperin to be published in our next book about Durkheim. It may come out when? Where is Daniel Witte? In two weeks, three weeks? Hope so. Would be fine. I come back to Professor Olivier Jean Jean, who will demonstrate in what way the German constitutional legal doctrine influenced the European and especially the French constitutional law, astonishing in itself because was it not the French who had invented constitutionalism, giving basic ideas about the pouvoir constituant and the pouvoir constitué? and the holy human rights to the constitutional world. Good reasons, therefore, to address the complicated relationship between German and French constitutional scholars, which nevertheless proved to be crucial for an understanding of legal constitutional thought in France. I have to present our speaker of today. Uh, you have read his uh, uh, CV, and uh, uh, let me give only some some uh, highlights. Uh, in general, it is completely impossible to reduce um, such a biography 
to three or four sentences, it is completely impossible to give right to uh, such a uh, specific way you have done in the academic world and we hope that some of the younger among you will still try to do this complicated and difficult way and we can't be very sure uh, whether we are not uh, the last dinos of this former age of science. At least Professor uh, Olivier Eugène Jean uh, is a studied scholar in law and the humanities at the same time. Uh, you received your doctoral degree with a thesis on the subject of le principe d'égalité devant la loi et le contrôle juridictionnel des actes du législateur et de l'administration en droit allemand. So, in French, a dissertation about German administrative law. Prior to assuming the role as chair of public law at the University Pontian Assas, cette fois-ci Paris 2, in 2014, you worked at the universities of Burgund, Dijon, Strasbourg. Since 2004, you have been honorary professor at the University of Freiburg. Furthermore, uh, he was fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study in Berlin. Wissenschaftskolleg uh, from 2011 until 2012. And at this very moment, we met at Sciences Po and I spoke out my first invitation. At this moment, it was not very, it, it takes in general five years sometimes. Uh, Professor Jean Jean has received numerous prizes for his research. His dissertation was honored, among others. With the Henri Gazin Prize, he has also received the research award from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. And I'm very glad that Dr. Melich, here present from Humboldt, is paying tribute to this achievement, as well as the Bartholdi Award. Uh, your research interests include public law in general, uh, German public law, legal theory, legal methodology, sometimes linked in a very complicated way. In addition, are you interested in the history of legal thinking as legal thought as such? Due to your expertise in German legal theory, uh, you have been regarded as an important, and you are regarded as an important mediator between German and French legal studies. We are on the way to prepare publications for Trivium, an internet journal edited by uh, Hinak Bruns in Paris, uh, where uh, legal thought in Germany and in France, legal cultures, legal constitutional cultures may be brought together, and I count very much uh, on your advice in that. In 2010, um, uh, you were admitted to the Association of German uh, Staatsrechtslehrer, die Vereinigung der Deutschen Staatsrechtslehrer. Hello. Presenter, no, excuse me, to present. To present uh, an author means uh, also to show what he has written. And this is a very long list, and I can't name everything, but at least some uh, points that seem to be very interesting. First, the dissertation I was naming uh, before. Then, very interesting, Une histoire de la pensée juridique en Allemagne, in 2005. Uh, and, uh, for example, uh, sur, uh, uh, you worked about Ernst Wolfgang Böckenförde, Le droit à l'État et la constitution démocratique, Essai de théorie juridique, politique et constitutionnelle, uh, that came out in La pensée juridique and the presentation was done by your uh, writing. Uh, Hermann Heller, Olivier Jouangean, La crise de uh, la théorie de l'État, Crise de l'État, Crise de la théorie, Paris, uh, Dalloz, uh, avec une traduction et aussi un, un commentaire, uh, un texte fascinant. Die juristische Ordnung der Demokratie, Europäische Grundrechte, zusammen mit Johannes uh, Massing, uh, vous avez travaillé aussi sur Terrorismusbekämpfung, Menschenrechtsschutz und Föderation, sorti chez, uh, came out with Maul Siebeck, 2008, 
And then I think uh, a book I'm very interested, I was very interested in also, uh, edited together with uh, Elisabeth Zoller uh, from uh, uh, Paris 2, uh, Pantheon Assas, Le Moment 1900, Critique Sociale et Critique Sociologique du Droit en Europe et aux États-Unis. Uh, that's a book I really would recommend you, though my proper article I had prepared did not come out, not because it was rejected, but I was too late, simply. And uh, I, there was a little bit too much work at this moment in my life. A last book I would like to mention, but I participated in the conference, and he urged me, he said, I will. No, he said, I send it in, and if there is something that should be corrected uh, in French, please send it. And he was very reluctant, he was very nice to me, and he invited a lot of invitations, but uh, this time it didn't work, next time, I'm, I'm sure it will. Uh, but um, this allows me also to make a hint to uh, the last book that came out. And this is, I think, especially for a lot of us, uh, most interesting because it has to do with um, a legal culture or better, a legal non-culture of the Nazi period. Um, uh, the, uh, it is entitled Justifier l'injustifiable l'injustifiable, l'ordre de discours juridique nazi. So it means there is a kind of order in the discourse and uh, uh, to, to really to seize uh, the proper logic of uh, uh, the Nazi law uh, thinking uh, is uh, very interesting. It's interesting for penal law, it's for, for all matters uh, absolutely central, especially when we see that even the character of charismatic leadership in the Weberian sense is by principle anti-juristic. So how the anti-juristic of uh, uh, this type of leadership is mediated through the juristic way of thinking. That could be and will be one of the main topics. Dans ce sens, Je me suis permis de demander uh, if we think in two sides, two different streams of legal thought. Je me suis, uh, je me suis demandé uh, dans un livre Voyage sociologique France-Allemagne est-ce qu'il y a deux habitudes de pensée le social, deux habitudes de cœur, deux habitudes du collectif, mais peut-être aussi deux habitudes de constituer la constitution, c'est ma question aujourd'hui, à vous, et je suis très curieux. The floor is yours, and once again, cher Olivier, bienvenue au Centre Droit comme Culture. Merci d'être venu et d'être avec nous et de partager votre savoir extraordinaire avec nous. Merci. Chez vous, vous êtes chez vous. Alors merci infiniment pour cette euh, présentation imméritée. Plus elles sont imméritées, plus elles font plaisir. But now I will speak English. And let's begin this speech with Sir Winston. And his famous address from the balcony of the Obet in Strasbourg, the city where I live. During the first meeting of the General Assembly of European Council in 1949, his first sentence was Prenez garde, je vais parler français. So I would simply say, be aware, I speak English. The story I want to tell you today is the story of the formation of constitutional law as a legitimated part of jurisprudence in two major countries for European continental law, Germany and France. <coughs> and the story took place during the end of the 19th century and in the first decades of the 20th. I have talked about a, a story, actually there were two stories, however not parallel stories, but they were linked each other in a certain way I will, to try, I will try to show further. There were 
also not, they were also not synchronous. And as a French lawyer, I must concede, German constitutional lawyers were the first. French constitutional law as jurisprudence or legal science came afterwards. The story begins in Germany very exactly between 1852 and 1865, I will explain further, and in France only in the 1890s. Nevertheless, these two stories have been linked to each other. And that's because French constitutional law has established itself in reaction, as a reaction to the German one. This reactional link explains also why the relationship has been mostly unilateral. German constitutional lawyers were not totally unaware of French constitutional law, of course, and of its doctrines. But this last was not constitutive for them. They may have some interest in French constitutional law as well as in English constitutional law, but this remained foreign law and at most material for comparative constitutional law. As far as I can see, <coughs> German constitutional lawyers were not inspired or not so much inspired by the French ones. On the contrary, most of the former French constitutional lawyers have taken a very meticulous care of German doctrines, of German constitutional dogmatic and theory to react to them. I will try to specify the types of reaction it were below. For now, I would only say these reactions were not only based on direct and frontal opposition, to German jurisprudence, but a mere and only positive reception of German constitutional law was almost impossible. The reason for this is quite simple and is clearly a political one. In 1871, France has, had lost Alsace-Moselle for the benefit of Germany. Resentment to Germany was the best shared feeling in France since then, and also among lawyers. World War I was the revenge and the demonstration that the imperial regime of Germany didn't have any lessons more to give to Europe, and so also not its apostles the German constitutional lawyers or jurists. So the question, why did French lawyers so much deal with German doctrines and did not only ignore them? One can point out at least two explanations, a general one and a more specific one. The general explanation is the consequence of the French-Prussian War of 1917-71. The overwhelming defeat has not been so much ascribed to the army as to the obvious deficiency of the whole system of elites in France. Education had to be changed, and especially higher education. The all centralized and outdated Napoleonic University couldn't compete with the modern Humboldtian universities of Germany. So simple to say. It was a light motive among French intellectuals at that time. Just look at Renan's famous book, La Réforme Intellectuelle et Morale de la France, 1871, just after the defeat, that German Universities Act had actually won the war. Political personnel and high administration had to be deeply modernized in France and in that way to be educated in new modern fields such as politics, economics, administrative science, and not the last constitutional law. I will describe below more accurately this dynamics of changes and its meeting for the law faculties and the jurisprudence in France. For now, I just want to claim a lot of French intellectuals at the beginning of the Third Republic in France were moved by a distinctive fighting spirit directed 
against German intellectuals, against Deutsche Professoren. Against, in a way, but also with. German academics were a model to French, it were the model French had to fight against, but it was a model. However, they were also a model. Solutions to some French deficiencies has to be taken up in Germany. Fascination and rejection together have shaped this particular relationship to Germany in the framework of what Claude Dijon, in his famous book, uh, called a uh, German crisis of the French thinking. <coughs> and my claim is the formation and early development of constitutional jurisprudence in France can only be right understood if these are considered as a part of this general intellectual crisis. A simple fact is many French authors in public law are quoting over and over the German scholars and demonstrating in doing so their perverse hate-love relationship to them. I now turn to the more specific explanation. The German science of constitutional law had in whole continental Europe the most important resonance at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th. As it will be said below, the strength of this German doctrine was seen in the very impressive fact constitutional law seemed to have become a strict legal science. And that meant a complete break with the ancient way and uh, constitutional and public law have been dealt, dealt with. A total rupture with what one of the most German constitutional lawyers around, around 1900, Paul Labant, called with contempt dilettantismus, dilettantism. In claiming that constitutional jurisprudence in order to become a genuine, genuine legal science has to be radically separated from any political, historical, philosophical and moral considerations, in its claim to develop a strict juristic study of constitutional law, the new German school has impressed a wide range of European scholars and beyond Europe, even in Japan, for instance. In almost every European country can be found, at the turn of the century, a native Labant. In the Netherlands, in Belgium, in Sweden, in Norway, in Hungary, in Austria, but also in South Europe, in Greece, in Spain, and especially in Italy where Vittorio Emanuele Orlando introduced the new German juristische Methode and uh, provoked such a disruption in the Italian history of public law that Italian historians are distinguishing nowadays between a pre- and a post-Orlando era in public law. Around 1900, there was an exceptional intellectual domination of this new German public law all above continental Europe. Spain is a peculiar case. But not in the little Gaulish village. Not in France, because of the reasons I've just above stated. My claim in this context is <coughs> the competitive relationship between Germany and France was even more tensed in the specific field of public and constitutional law precisely because on this terrain German lawyers have become really and extremely dominant in Europe and had at the end of the 19th century completely marginalized the French constitutional jurisprudence, the French who have invented modern constitution. But it must be added, so the competition was with the constitutional jurisprudence, it could also be the French constitutional legacy which would be pushed in the shadow and in clear terms. That means the legacy of the breakthrough French Revolution as the founding event of continental constitutionalism. 
Yet, the French constitutional jurisprudence, what was at the end of the 19th century the doctrine of a new republic, which throughout the Napoleonic and monarchic regimes had reconnected the French political change of time back to the revolution. That must, must not be uh, for, forgotten. As François Furet has shown, in this first time of the Third Republic, the feeling was the revolution has been finally finished and it must be now fully achieved. For French constitutional lawyers, it is obviously not the time in which an authoritarian imperial constitutionalism, I mean the German one, may acquire the right to rule all over Europe. It's really not the time for that. However, due to its deep scientific renewal, German constitutional jurisprudence had a large step ahead compared to French one. So I will divide my talk in two parts. The renewal of German jurisprudence in public law, its meanings, its problems, its evolution until World War I, and then German constitutional jurisprudence in France and I will say a suspicious responsiveness as reception before I will give some conclusive remarks. So, first, at first. At the beginning of this lecture, I've outlined my topic as the story of the formation of constitutional law as a legitimated part of jurisprudence in France and Germany. I have now to precise what I have meant with the expression a legitimated part of jurisprudence. And I will further recount how this legitimation has been granted to Staatsrecht, let me say for the moment, constitutional law in Germany. In the 17th and 18th century, German word Staatsrecht <coughs> has translated the Latin expression jus publicum. Jus publicum had a tradition in the German universities since the 16th century, and that's a difference with France, where the droit public until the end of the Ancien Régime has been only taught in Paris, Besançon and Strasbourg, but these last two towns were cities of the Holy Empire until the end of the 17th century, and belongs so far to the German tradition, German tradition of public law. In the first half of 19th century in Germany, and more precisely in the so-called formats, the period since the foundation of German <coughs> Confederation and until the defeat of the National Liberal Revolution of 1848-1849, Staatsrecht became an important issue in Germany because it was the time of the first German constitution, of the modernization of administrations and of the state apparatus, of liberal claims, and of conservative reactions, of politicization of bourgeoisie and civil society. It was also the time to surmount, to of him, according to what uh, Hegel meant with the term, to surmount the legacy of the French Revolution, which, which was the matter with which the whole Europe had to deal with, not only the French, and so say Fichte. The word Rechtsstaat, and traduisim en anglais, concentrated in itself the major issue of this doctrine of Staatsrecht and was the center of semantic fights between liberals and conservatives. The interpretation of public law and especially of constitutional law couldn't be something else as a political issue. Law and politics couldn't be separated. It was not due to a deficiency of the constitutional lawyer, it was structural. Almost every constitutional interpretation was heavily political loaded due to the very tense political context. It is no coincidence that after the defeated revolution of 1848, in the time of political reaction, the advocacy of an unpolitical constitutional jurisprudence arose. This was the claim of Karl Friedrich Gerber, and a little later of Paul Labant. The time of depoliticization, it's too difficult to, to say, of public law, of a high political field, 
The time of the so-called Gerber Labant School had come. The new program was laid down by Gerber in the first stages of his first book on German public law entitled Über öffentliche Rechte on Public Rights, published in 1852, the first day I gave. He rejects there the old way to deal with public law as an enumeration and descriptions of the rights to govern, to govern as complete as possible. I quote, a genuine, a genuine scientific handling of public law requires conceiving it as a scientific totality with an internal unity. And that means, I quote, the specific legal principle that characterizes the element of public law in contrast to other rights, and that are private rights, must be discovered. And this task, the task of the new public law is therefore to find out the criterion which distinguishes and separates public from private rights. The specific quality of any public right which gives this characteristic and unity and which makes jurisprudence able to construct the system of public law. The second book of Gerber is called Grundzüge eines System des Deutschen Staatsrechts, that is, heißt, Principles of a System of German Public Law, 1865. There is no science of law without a system of law. In the architectonics of pure reasons of Kant's first critic, it's made clear <coughs> that systematicity is what makes the difference between mere knowledge and science. And Gerber was not the first who claimed for systematicity in jurisprudence. It was at the beginning of the 19th century the major claim which renewed the study of Roman law. It was the claim of the so-called historical legal school, at the, which didn't understand history as a narrative, but as a self-developing system, as the dynamics of a Volksgeist. According to Savigny, legal science has to be both historical and systematic in order to be genuine historical. It has, in the, it has to be understood the unity of both historical and the systematic. To understand, to understand Gerber's own undertaking, it must never be forgotten that he was the student of his beloved teacher, Georg Friedrich Puchta, one of the most important epigones, Savinius. With a great logical stringency, even more than Savigny himself, Puchta had developed a system of civil law based on one first and guiding concept, that of subjective right. Subjective Recht. A right is said a I quote, possibility of the will. And legal system, a system of possibilities of the will. That means the objective law code, statutes, and all sorts of regulations is a, so, a kind of machine with, by which a natural uh, will, I would say with kind of savage will, will, can be encoded in order to be transformed in a legally effective will. A will that gave a power. A right is a power. That is a right which cannot be which can be which can be enforced by legal means. Therefore, a subjective right can be defined as a power of will. Willensmacht. Everybody knows. This determination has been the canonic definition of subjective right in Germany until the end of 19th century. It must be added, what has legally consistency is not the why of the will, I mean the purpose, the goals, but only the fact that it has been wanted according to the law. To make that clear, legally it doesn't matter the reason why you buy a car the goal, whether you need the car, the need, whether it's your own interest to buy the car, 
interest. What only matters is that you've expressed your will to buy a car in the right forms. It's a very Kantian concept of law. Uh, for more one, you know, there are many discussions, no. and also a liberal one. Uh, legal historians are talking about the liberalism in private law. Privatrecht liberalism. The last point of this concept of right elaborated in the concept in the historical school is any wheel needs a substrate that is a subject. We call it a person. A person can be individual but also collective one. So, uh, an important discussion in the 19th century was the question whether collective persons had, had a reality or are, were, are just fictions. Georgi Elinek Putinen at this debate asserting that collective persons are neither realities nor fictions but abstractions of some real social relationships. As a close friend of Max Weber, he was the first German lawyer who have taken sociology seriously. So far as the person, individual or collective, as subject of rights <coughs> is placed at the point of departure of the whole system, this has been called, especially by its French adversaries and by Dugui, legal subjectivism. Transposed in the field of public law, this basic principle of a liberal private law have led to a very conservative and almost reactionary public law. The unpolitical political law wasn't political neutral. It was the monarchic committed law of constitutional monarchies. It was a new legal scientific construction of monarchist principe laid down in Article 57 of the Vienna Act of 1820 or so to the German Confederation. According to this article, the entire authority of the territorial states, the sovereignty of the state, lies, resides in the monarch, who gives a constitution that only organizes a power which remains his own power. There is no separation of powers. Nevertheless, the Gerber's interpretation of German monarchic constitutions had to make a radical break with a traditional patrimonial conception of monarch and state, state understood as the good of the monarch. Let's end with this. It was a, a theory uh, supported uh, especially by Romeo Mauren Brescia. I quote him because he was professor in Bonn. They were not uh, all the best. Damals. So, how private and public law can be conceptually separated each other in the context of a science of law considered as a specific science of human will? This answer is by differencing the kind of wills. More precisely, two modes of will. The principle of private law is to oblige the will of somebody else because there is power. His consent is required. Normally. Not always. It's the principle of a horizontal relationship and the le legal condition for the validity of my right and of your obligation. On the contrary, the will of state creates legal obligations without the concept of the persons obliged. It is the peculiar legal capacity of the will of state, the legal characterization of the Staatsgewalt, the state's power, public power. It is to be Herrschaft, domination. Herrschaft is therefore the demarcation criterion between private and public law. That's a very nice construction, indeed. A great logical building of law where public law houses in a big and well furnished flat lived. It's a construction of public law according to the path of dependency of German legal thinking. It's subjectivism. Public law is the law of the power of the will of the state. And as far as the state herrscht, rules, governs, dominates, the new Staatsrecht answers the question what and how can want the state? The state as such is the subject of this right to govern. The perfection of the system is reached when the state <coughs> has been defined 
as a legal persona. But there was a big problem. To dominate means imposing my will on another. In the domination's relationship, the will of the dominated counts for nothing. Legally, the power of will of the dominated is zero. And that means, as a dominated, one has no legal power of will, no right, no subjective right against the dominating state. And as a consequence, the logical consequence of this construction. The subjectivist construction of the stats, of the Staatsrecht led to the impossibility to construct the subjective right of the individual. Private persons were, so Goebbels, object, Gegenstand or object of state's power. Exactly the contrary of subjects of rights. Goebbels and Lavat's approach couldn't solve the problem of public law according to the premise of legal subjectivism. The domination's relationship couldn't be constructed as a legal relationship, as a Rechtsverhältnis, which presupposes on both sides of this relationship legal subjects, subjective positions, subjective rights. On the one side of this relationship, there was just the individual as object of domination. Yet, the major problem of this subjectivist Staatsrecht has to be expressed as follows how a domination's relationship can be thought and constructed as a legal relationship. And that's the very problem of the Staatsrecht of a Rechtsstaat. The other's way led to an apparee. And a public law within just one subject can be conceived it should be. a public law within just one subject can be conceived faced by mere objects of domination as but a nonsense. So said the most important German constitutionalist at that time, Georg Jelinek. He was a very sophisticated jurist who attempted to renew the science of public law with a new Kantian theory of science and committed, besides Max Weber, into the foundation of social sciences in Germany. The German historiography presents him generally as an epigon of Goebbels and Laban. Actually, he was their first harsh critic. I cannot here insist on every aspect of J.D. Next thought I've dealt with in, uh, since more than 20 years. I've written a few years ago a long introduction to the new edition of the first translation of his mon monumental theory of state in French, l'état moderne et son, droit, et son droit. I will just show the way he took to escape from Goebbels Apori. Good jurists are productive workers. They produce concepts to resolve social, political and even sometimes ethical problems. They work on concepts, at concepts, with concepts and in concepts. A good jurist knows if I am in an apparel, that can only be because there's something wrong in the premises in the first concept. The juristic work is also largely a work of imagination to resolve. Uh, an object of my research on history legal thought since more than 20 years is precisely the imaginative ability of jurists how they produce concepts that can change, change the law, even the Nazis, without changing the text of constitutions, statutes or codes. Jurists produce law by concepts, because no legal text lays down the significance of such words as state, people, sovereignty, subjective right, and many more. Free imagination can be at work. An ordinary legal positivism is a blind theory of positive law that believes the whole law lives within the text of positive law. But positive texts are just cheese law with many holes and gaps. And uh, legal concepts are born to be wild. To avoid a Porian nonsense, Yelena claims the two first concepts have to be modified. At first, as a legal person, Okay, but the state should be conceived uh, not as an Anstalt, 
as a public institute or agency, I don't know how to translate, that would mean an, exterior, an external device or apparatus of domi domination facing its untertanen as its object, but as a corporation whose members are its citizen legally established as free subjects. Domination is only one legal aspect of the state. Its cooperative dimension is the other one, and it changes the conditions under which one has to consider the relationship between state and individual. The state has a so social integrative function that domination alone cannot support. A state cannot integrate mere objects of its domination. Condition to integration is recognition as subject. The second, to the second, the, defi the definition of subjective rights as a power of will is a canonic one, but not truth living happily in what Rudolf Hering uh, had called the paradise of legal concepts. It is not a platonic idea. And Yering has had already proposed a radical change in this concept. A subjective right would be a legally protected interest. Interest. In this sense, the relationship between state and individual wouldn't be a mere relationship between two opposite wills, but also a relation of interests. If the pursued interest is one of the condition of legal validity, that's the point. The point. Excuse me. Uh, of the will, the dominating will of the state is therefore in its legal concept already limited, and that was the, the, the point, by the substantive notion of its own interest, which is called public interest. Beyond these limits, the will of the state has no right to dominate. In the sphere of private interest, the public will, ca the public will cannot be constructed as a stronger than private wills, because the domination of state legally ends with its own interest. The substantive notion of interest stops the legal validity of domination, not the definition of right as a power of the will. Under these two premises, the idea constructs the actual system of subjective public rights, public subjective rights. This system is the result of an a priori deduction. It is not built on uh, the basis of an induction from positive law. The core of the system is the famous theory of statuses. There are a priori four types of possible relationships between state and individual. The first, are, the first two are relations of mutual exclusion. Where the individual has no interest to oppose to the state, he stands in a position of pure submission. He, his will is legally overruled by the will of the state. In the status of pure, it is the status of pure domination, the passive status. On the contrary, where the state has no interest to oppose the individual, the private sphere where private interest excludes any public interest, that is the state free sphere, which is called neg negative status. And the other two relations of collaboration based on congruence of private and public interest. At first, when it is of public interest to support private interest by providing some services of, or goods, or a legal procedure, for instance. And in this sphere, both the will of state and the will of the private person have to converge in order to satisfy both interests. In this sense, the state bolsters private interests and acts according to this aim. This is the positive status. When the individual is allowed, the second, to act in the name of the state as an organ or part of an organ of state, the possibility to participate at the formation of state's will then, state's will is the will of the state and obviously not the will of an individual. But, therefore, in the act of wanting for the state, the individual doesn't exercise 
an own subjective right. Let's take the case of the so-called right to vote. Yelinek says a general right to vote doesn't exist because the elector, when, when he votes, acts as part of the special state organ, which is called the electoral body. His right is the right to have access to the election. And it's individual. To be incorporated in the electoral body. And the special relationship is the active status. Active civitid, schreibt the Österreicher. Four brief remarks. This theory of statuses is an a priori deduction. It means it doesn't describe the actual position of a citizen in a state. Statuses are the transcendental categories through which you can scientifically describe positive law and bring this positive constitutional law into a scientific system. Secondly, these four stages are actually four types of relationships. Subjective rights, according to Yelinek, are not immanent or inherent qualities of a human subject. Such an understanding of subjective right <coughs> would necessarily lead to a just, just naturalistic philosophy of law. Subjective rights have to be understood under the category of the relationship and not of substance. If you don't understand that, you don't understand the Yelinek. Because there is no a priori content of subjective rights. It would be natural law. Only a posteriori according to the law of the state. Thirdly, these four statuses are covering together the whole scape of legal personality of individual. Legal personality is juris publici, says Jelinek, a construction of the state, also in private law. And a legal person is therefore not a substantial or substantive concept, but a conceptual system of relationships. This remark is decisive for anybody who tries to understand Yelinek, and yet very often overlooked by commentators, I would say. This theory brings out the fundamental schematism of what a legal person is, not have. It is an a priori deduction which, which concludes to four types of statuses of relationships which constitute the legal subject. If I had add Yelinek in the first pages of his book, System of Subjective Public Rights, laments the lack of any Kant in the jurisprudence who would have reformed the theory of legal knowledge. It's not preposterous to claim, at first, Yelinek wanted to be this first Kant in the jurisprudence. And his theory of statuses is, according to me, an analog to Kant's table of the categories. I claim it is constructed according to a transcendental method the table of the categories of legal subjectivity. With Jelinek, at the beginning of the 20th century, German public law had reached a very high level of sophistication. Uh, I go directly to Dugui. It's already late. <coughs> so, Let's begin our short travel in the classical French constitutional jurisprudence with Léon Duguy, 1859-1928. He was professor at the University of Bordeaux, where he met Émile Durkheim. And uh, from the beginning, he took a great interest in sociology. Auguste Comte, who invented the word sociology, was his first reference. And as a contien, Duguy claimed his own positivism. In Durkheim's Division du Travail Social, published in 18, 
1893, when both of them were colleagues in Bordeaux, Dugui found the core concept of sociology, I mean solidarity. Then he, he undertook to elaborate legal science as a positive science of social solidarity. Law as the system of forms by which individuals in a society <coughs> organize and exercise <coughs> solidarity and which, because it's distinguished law from other normative uh, social orders, and which are considered as important enough to be sanctioned by a collective organized response. As such, law is both a product and a producer of social solidarity. It takes a great part in the dynamics of social solidarity. As a product of the society, law emerges spontaneously from a given structure of social solidarity. What Duggy calls normative rules. The output of the will of state and of its legislators, excuse me, what Duggy calls normative rules was not the output of the will of state and of its legislators, but an emerging property of social systems. The duty of governments is only to implement these spontaneous normative rules in enacted, enacting what Duggy calls constructive rules. Excuse me. So, constructive rules. Carl Schmitt says concepts are weapons. For once, he's right. Solidarity, translated by Duggy in social interdependence, was a weapon against the whole German jurisprudence. When Duguay's treatise on, of constitutional law, five volumes, uh, three editions, the last between 19, uh, 1927 and 1930, must be read as the most elaborated answer to and directly against German constitutional jurisprudence. Herrschaft was the founding concept of German constitutionalism. Solidarity replaces domination and becomes in degree the positive basis of law in general and of constitutional law in particular. Domination cannot be the basic concept of a law based on a sociological approach. And if domination disappears from the construction of public law, all its derivatives disappear as well. I mean, it was an incredible, ambitious undertaking to build a whole system of public law without the concepts of public power, I mean, puissance publique or staatsgewalt, sovereignty, will, and so on. And it led to the destruction of the legal concept of state as a legal person. A state is nothing more than the social group of governance rulers who have the only task to implement normative rules by constructive rules. And in doing so, the state takes on its specific, takes on its specific social function. The state is not distinguished and even less separated from the society uh, monument of German thinking. It's only a social group among many others and assuming a peculiar social function. The concept of state as a legal 
through some person conceals the sociological knowledge, transforming a social function in a right. The right to rule, imputed to the person state. Legal personality is a mere fiction, nothing positive, nothing real. Duguay claims for legal realism and he criticizes harshly such metaphysical costs that come from Germany and that constitute together only the window dressing of the Gorgon's house of German imperialistic state of pure domination. More profoundly, De Guy's approach can be read as a radical criticism of the will's metaphysics, which was pervasive in German philosophy, but also in the legal science since the 19th century, and I must say, not only in Germany, but in France also. But De Guy, it main expression was autonomie de la volonté, Huh. Will's autonomy is my translation. But Duggy claims no will can positively, that's my po the point of view of Duggy, can positively subjugate another will. How it is possible. So the concept of subjective right. The power of will exercised on another will cannot exist. It's pure metaphysics. And so the concept of subjective right, <coughs> it cannot exist as a power of a will because, simply because, a will has no power. The whole German construction of law and constitutional law is based, so to Guy, on an empty concept and propagates, therefore, a mere ideology of imperialism. Against the German subjectivist approach of public law, Duggy sets is his own objectivist, sociological and positivistic approach. You can see there are many, many different positivism in legal sciences and not only legal. The state is not a big person who dominates from the hate of his big will, but a social group that has to fulfill its own social function. And the idea of social function must replace the concept of subjective right. The social functions of the governance of the rulers is to provide all the services that in a gi given society guarantee social interdependence according to the definition of solidarity and that private initiative cannot provide through its own means and that is the exact definition Duggy gives to explain the meaning of service public also, I say service public because public service in England is, it? is not the same. It's not the fonctionnaire, service public. The state is in that way no more than a, I quote, cluster of public services. My translation, I'm proud of it. Faisceau de service public. Legal realism was Duggy's watch word. The methodological approach was declared as a sociological one. Actually, Duggy never undertook any so sociological inquiry. Dieter Grimm says correctly that was sociology at desk. Duggy's constitutional law was not a sociology, sociology of law but a legal sociologism is quite different. He recycled sociological concept in a legal science 
in order to compete the German dominating German science. He claimed to be a radical positivist and handled law as a social fact. Conclusion to Duguy is everyone knows Durkheim's main mythological rule in sociology was to deal with social facts as if they are things. Traiter les faits sociaux comme des choses. But Durkheim never said social facts are things. Or I'm wrong. No. My claim is Duguy has never reflected this small word come as if this necessary fiction <coughs> that according to Durkheim makes sociology possible. Duguy's positivism, realism and sociologism were much more rustical than Durkheim's. In the foreword, foreword uh, to the second edition of his Traité de droit constitutionnel, 1920, Duguy writes, First World, World War was the collision of two ideas. I quote, it was the fight of the idea of the state as ruling power, sovereignty, against the idea of the state as collaboration between the members of the same national community. Because the idea of collaboration has won war, it has to be fully realized and therefore the constitutional science of state as cluster of service public must be achieved. But the Strasbourg professor Raymond Carrel Malbert, 1861-1935, answers to Duguy in the same year, in the foreword to his own famous book, Contribution à la théorie générale de l'État, Contribution to the General Theory of State. According to him, Duguy confuses fact and law. I quote, it is it is not correct to reason, to reason from the necessary fact of collaboration to the legitimacy of theories that try to exclude from the definition of state the concept of power of puissance. Duguay confuses the notion of power as a legal criterion of state and the reality of the German political power as an imperialism without any moral code. So, Carré de Malberg. Duguay succumbs to what we would call naturalistic fallacy. And German lawyers are bad guys who have done a good job, as Trump would say. On this way, Carré de Malberg claims that French constitutional jurisprudence has to accept the German concept of state and the methodology of constitutional law, and I, I don't have to insist on this point because it's already clear, but Karen Malbert is a native Alsatian who lived Alsace in 1870 with his family. He was a young boy and stayed on the other side of the Vosges in Nancy, where he began his academic career until he could join back Strasbourg in 1919. He had no pronounced taste for German people and German politics. As tut mir leid. So it is. So, on the one hand, he, he takes up the whole conceptual apparatus of the German constitutional jurisprudence. But, on the other hand, he proceeds with a shift, procedure, déplacement, glissement. He cuts off this apparatus from its German constitutional 
principle and put it onto the truly French constitutional principle. That's the this is a acting that's that's one. The German principle was the monarchic principle, as we saw. Of course, I make a they don't discuss even after the First World War. Uh, they don't discuss the Weimar jurisprudence. They discuss with the old jurisprudence of the empire. The only German uh, or Germ Germanic uh, jurisconsults which are known and discussed are Karl Schmidt and Hans Kelsen uh, some years later. But on the, 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 the big quarrel on methods in the approaches in the Weimar Republic, there is no word in the French literature at the time. So, of course, the monarchic principle cannot be the constitutional principle of the French Third Republic, but the principle of the Third Republic cannot only be the fruit of historical contingencies after the lost war against Prussia. It was not a real constitutive moment for politics and state. Um, the beginnings of the Third Republic were wobbly and uncertain. Karin Malberg looks for the true principle of French constitutionalism with which the Third Republic had reconnected. And the true principle resides in the French Revolution, of course. And more specifically, in the first stage of the revolution, in its founding moment, the period between 1789 and 1791, between the declaration of rights and the first constitution, the true principle of French constitutionalism is national sovereignty, not monarchic principle which has been laid down in the Article 3 of the Declaration, I quote, the principle of any sovereignty resides essentially in the nation. No body, no individual can exert authority which does not emanate expressly from it. Sovereignty resides in the nation. Essentially, it doesn't mean mainly, but by essence. However, the nation cannot be legally considered as a pre-state entity which would have per se a kind of unity or of personality without a minimal organization that can, that can unify the will of the nation there's actually no nation just multitude on the other hand according to this principle the state must presuppose the existence of a nation as the sovereign. This presupposition is purely logical, as but a fiction. And this fiction is very precisely, in Carré de Malberg, the fiction of representation. The whole work of Carré de Malberg peaks in his very sophisticated theory of representation. To that end, he takes up the first sentence of Ismail. Uh, I didn't. Well, Ismail was the first who wrote the, uh, an important uh, treatise on constitution. And the, the first sentence of this treatise was The state is the juristic personification of the nation. L'État est la, personific la personification juridique. De la nation. According to German monarchic principle <coughs> and construction of the state as a legal person, this German state, state personifies nothing but itself. That's why German lawyers cannot find a real limit to state Herrschaft. 
even if Karel Malbert concedes, Yelinex theory of cooperation has to be seen as a progress in that way. But not the theory of representation by Yelin, which is completely different. The true French constitutional state, on the contrary, personifies something else, I don't say someone else, something else, the sovereign nation as a fiction. And as such, by ruling the nation, he must be conceived as governing the nation on behalf of this nation. It doesn't exert its own rights of domination of government, but a right the essence of which resides in the nation. That is in this dialectical relationship between state and nation that Carré de Malbert properly calls representation. To represent, he says, means to have the right to want for the nation. Actually, it's an Hobbesian figure of representation in the Leviathan. But uh, I'm not sure whether Karen Malbert has been aware of this. Person personifying or representing the nation means, therefore, constituting the nation as the sovereign by wanting for it and on behalf of it. That's the magic of constitutional law. You know, it's wonderful. I appreciate it. But it has also practical consequences. Taken in the circle of representation, the sovereign power of the state cannot be legally constructed as an unlimited one. Because according to this legal constriction, I would say imagination of the state, the power it exerts is not its own power. The circle of representation is actually the circle of what Yelena called auto-limitation, a concept that Karen Malberg took over and that Tugui couldn't understand. Auto-limitation. How can the state limit itself? Uh, and you see there, if you say, by its will, you are lost. Though my will cannot limit my will. So, But you see, it's a pure metaphysical speculation on state. I must apologize that I have not time to outline Maurice Oriou, theory of constitutional law. In defense, I would stress the fact that he didn't read German. His knowledge of German law is of second hand. He tries a middle way through his famous theory of the institution. Institutions, more precisely, Incorporated institutions are a mix of objective and subjective elements. He, he endeavors to escape both the German subjectivist foundation of public law and the objectivism of Duguay's sociological approach. Uh, yes, institution is a mix of subjective and objective. That, uh, I must say that, tell that to uh, Peter Heberle once, one time and not only objective, as a mistake. However, uh, Hou Yu has had as well as Du Yi a great inclination for sociology, but his main reference resides in Gabriel Tard as a major competitor to Durkheim. In Tard, Hou Yu found probably an impetus for his own theory of the institution as a balance between order, power, and freedom. In town, societies are built on balance between uh, rules of, imi of imitation and rule of invention. The theory of the institution means an equal distance from any unilateral foundation of law, either on ob objective rules or on ob subjective rights. Both were dismissed. None of them can explain the durability of law. Objective rules doesn't emerge from an anarchic society, and subjective rights have no value and no validity per se. 
you have to combine both sides. The base of law resides in the institution as a sustainable order that balances each other the antagonistic forces of power on one side and freedom on the other side. So, against the German, he claimed that the concept of institution explained much better public law than the legal notion of person, which is actually for him empty. A conclusion. First of all, I must concede I love all these jurists and very much. They are great jurist concepts. I know today it's not so trendy to distinguish between great and small, between great and small lawyers. But I don't care. For our history of jurisprudence, the so-called small lawyers may play a role. I don't discuss that, but I'm not an historian and I'm not a legal historian. I pick up some historical materials to reflect on the law, and that's something else. In that way, the selection of works is up to my own discretion. It cannot be discussed. Only by myself. Doing so, I don't read those I call great lawyers in order to find in them some eternal truth about what law is or ought to be. I'm interested in how great lawyers are losing their time tinkering with their law. I mean, tinkering their conceptual apparatus. Because legal science is primarily conceptual work. That's the cultural legacy cultural legacy of Roman law. In his wonderful book, Use the Invention of Law in Occident, Aldo Schiavone shows how and why the true birth of Roman jurisprudence must be seen in Quintus Musius Scrivola when he began to abstract, to define bringing legal words up to the dignity of concepts. He began to put law in a conceptual order and uh, that was the very first beginning of systematization. But I'm not a fan of Begriff jurisprudence, conceptual jurisprudence, a pejorative word Yering invented. Conceptual jurisprudence in the 19th century believed that concepts tell us the essence of things. That legal concepts have to be substantive concepts. They were realists, according to the meaning of this word in the medieval philosophy. The universals, these universal, are actually existing. That's, that is why I'm not looking for eternal legal truth in the great authors. Legal concepts are only functions of legal discourse. That's what I think I've learned in Jelinek and further in Kelsen. I have also a little book on Kelsen. My research program is to look at the way jurists are constructing their structuring concepts, their fundamental apparatus this is what I call the grammar of legal discourse. That general, the generative structure of legal narrative, how they are recycling concepts of other scientific fields, sociology or philosophy or what are or epistemology. And what are in these discourses the conceptual intrigues, how far they work how far concepts were and where they fail. The motto of a great lawyer should be DIY. Concepts are not given, but constructed to do things with words. And the fascinating is how much speculative work can need the solution of a problem. I think that's why I became a jurist. Yelinek's work on 
public subjective right seems to me to be exemplary and almost flawless in its own context. And my research field is what I've called in my book on German legal science in the 19th century, the treasures of juristic imagination. I hope I've shown you in my talk how huge were these treasures around 1900 in France in, and Germany in order to settle down a functional grammar of legal discourse on public law. Thank you very much.